am, I am, I am persuaded that I would now have a better prospect than Mrs. Thatcher of leading the Conservatives into a fourth electoral victory. The calamity of a Labour government. I have accordingly informed the Chief Whip, Tim Renton, and the Chairman... Toreg. Prime Minister will need to sort out your nomination papers. Dare he? Sitting Prime Minister. And Crown Leoncelot has requested a meeting to confirm the date of the ballot. The 20th? But won't you be in Paris on the 20th? Yes, the CSC summit. You remember, of course, what the CSC summit is, Cranley. Yes. Yes, the uh, Cold War thing, summit. The Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, Cranley. President Bush, President Gorbachev, Chancellor Cole, President Mitterrand and myself will be meeting to celebrate the end of the Cold War thing, as you so quaintly put it. Yes, quite. <laughs> I rather think our time is better spent organising the fall of socialism than going cap in hand around tea rooms importuning backbenchers, most of whom would not be where they are today were it not for us anyway. Wouldn't you agree? The 20th it is, Prime Minister. And Cranley. Congratulations. Re-elected as chairman of the 1922 committee. <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. Unopposed, I understand. <laughs> That's what I call an election. I imagine, Prime Minister, you'll be wanting one or two substantial cabinet figures to propose a second year. Um, Douglas Hurd, John Major? Yes, good. United in support. And make it public, I'd have thought. Hmm. I'll start to get them round the studios. The big gun should help to see this off. Douglas and John will stay on side. But anything else is inconceivable. Could be well, just what she needs. She wins. Gets a bit of a shock, becomes more manageable. We squeeze through the next election, and then she can go off her own free will. Do you think she ever would go off her own free will? Surely, even she would see the sense in that. I imagine, uh, in the event, you would be the party's favoured unity candidate. Do you think? Possibly. You? Oh, I would never presume. No. Of course. <laughs> anyway, I'm afraid uh, I shall have to leave you all to it for a few days. Infected wisdom teeth, spot of minor surgery required. So you'll be off limits? Only for a few days. We must keep in touch, though. Of course. Oh, no, no, on me, Douglas. I insist. You're the Chancellor? So we think between 230 and 240 for you, Prime Minister, and Michael less than 100, which gives you a clear-cut victory in the first ballot. Thank you, Peter. I don't want to be churlish or anything, Margaret, but I think those figures might be a little optimistic. Trust me, Kenneth, I've done the tea rooms. People are very positive. I've already got Michael in excess of 120, possibly as high as 150 and 40 abstentions. That would mean a second ballot. Are we sure about this Paris thing, Margaret? 
Is that wise? I'd have thought a few personal phone calls, the odd visit. Gordon, if we pull out of Paris now, we'll just be accused of running scared. No, the decision is made. Surely, what we should be discussing now is how to unite the party once we've won. Here. Trust me. All in here. Come along, everyone. Lunch will be getting cold. Airy Neve? Yes, dear. Mind your feet. I didn't know he was a supporter. Neither did I. But it seems he wants to see the back of Ted almost as much as we do. And I'm his best chance. He's got all kinds of plots in mind. Well, I suppose if he got out of cold, it's... Must we have all this in here, love? As long as you keep out of the way, there won't be a problem. Now, come along, dear. I'm sure there's plenty you can be getting on with. The back benches. That's where Ted's weakness lies. They want him out. We have to get you in amongst them a bit more. You don't visit the tea rooms now. I've got a husband, Harry, family. I simply don't have time for all that. You're going to have to make time. Court them. I'd say they are small groups at a time. Now, I want you to meet Rupert. Rupert, can I introduce Mrs. Thatcher? Rupert. What is this? This is yes. Listen. Flatter. Your votes are with the small fry. They want a leadership that listens. You're a woman. Everyone's playing it as though it's a disadvantage. I'm not so sure. Uh, and I think we need to take off a few of those sharp edges. Feminine. Not exactly feminist. <laughs> Margaret. What people don't realise about me is that I am a very ordinary person who leads a very ordinary life. No. No. Doing the teaching thing again. Just say it. I'm a very ordinary person who leads a very ordinary life. I'm a very ordinary person. No! Now you sound like Joyce Grenfell. Relax. Be natural. Sounds like you've got one of those bloody hats of yours down your throat. What's wrong with my hats? Nothing. Nothing at all. They're great hats. You've just got to stop wearing them, that's all. And I'm not sure about the pearls, either. I am not losing my pearls. Beautiful pearls. Don't get me wrong. But such a cliché. Playing into their hands. Twin set and pearls. Tory lady. They were a present from Dennis. Oh, God, now you're shrieking again. Sweet. Gentle. Softly, softly. Catchy Tory. I am not a Tory lady. For goodness sake, my father was a grocer. Exactly. And that's what we've got to get out there. It'll do you a damn sight more good than those bloody hats. OK. We'll give it a rest. No. Again. We will do it. Now. Again. Sit down, please. We will do it. What people don't realize about me is that I'm a very ordinary person. That's better. Slower. Warmer. Chest voice. Open throat. Who leads a very ordinary life? We think we've got 120 pledges for you, with Ted at less than 80. If it's true, it's the end of him. But no one must know about these figures. We tell them we think we may have 70 maximum. What we have to do now is quietly convince certain people that you can't win. At the same time as you are fighting your heart out, knowing that you just might. Does that make sense? 
You must understand, Margaret, you are an act of rebellion for some of them, an act of revenge for others, a means to an end for most, for nearly all of them. You are simply a way of getting Heath out. The woman doing the men's dirty work, expendable. You're up against Healy, aren't you? In a couple of days. Capital transfer tax. I'm leading. Healy's a bully. He's bullied Ted. He's bullied Carr. They're waiting for someone to stand up to him. No one gives you a chance. Least of all, Ted. It's up to you now. This is not our show any longer, Margaret. It's up to you. Mom, I'm off. Off where? Mom, I told you. Everything's too mad here. I've got my exams next week. Sue's off me her spare room again. Well, don't be a stranger. No, Mum, thanks. Good luck tomorrow. You all right with this? I feel a bit like we're booting you out. No, it's fine. Are you all right? Me? Of course. All a bit of a pantomime at the moment, but uh, we'll get through. Yes. The Right Honourable Lady's speech is nothing but a defiant reassertion of birth and privilege. <laughs> she has clearly decided to tag her party as the party of the rich few, and herself as la passionara of privilege. <laughs> I believe that she and her party will regret it. <laughs> I wish I could say that the Chancellor of the Exchequer had done himself less than justice. Unfortunately, I can only say I believe he has done himself justice. Some Chancellors are macroeconomic, other Chancellors are fiscal, this one is just plain cheap. <laughs> if this Chancellor can be Chancellor, anyone in the House of Commons can be Chancellor. <laughs> Capital transfer tax would affect not only the one in a thousand to whom he referred, but everyone including people born like I was, with no privilege at all. Yeah! 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 Yeah!